Um, so yeah, again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining uh, to our annual virtual town hall for the uh, UC uh, working group. Um, it's been it's been about a year uh, since we had this uh, this large annual meeting last year at SIGGRAPH. Um, so this is a fantastic, fantastic day, and thank you all for, for joining. Um, quickly, the agenda. Uh, so we, for people who are not super familiar with this group, uh, we're going to have a quick uh, intro into our user working group here. And uh, then uh, we're going to go through a couple of updates we, we had over this past year. Uh, then we're going to introduce the, the sub-working groups that we have, and they're going to go through their updates for the year. And then we have Scott Gefford from the from the Met uh, with a short presentation. Um, and then we're going to talk about the, the new announcement from two weeks ago, uh, which is the Alliance for Open ESD uh, and what that means for um, our working group here. Go through a few details. And then at the end, uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A um, to discuss any of this uh, or talk ESD if you want to. Um, okay, cool. So USD Working Group um, is really a place for all of you. It's a it's a place for the USD community to come together to discuss uh, new features, new USD features, to discuss uh, issues people found or encountered while they were working with USD. Um, it's a fantastic place to present interesting work um, that people have done. Um, at work or outside, um, it's it's a place for people to showcase use cases people might not have thought of before that are that are totally um, relevant, but maybe maybe new um, or not not that, that common, not that known. Um, it's also a place for for people to put up proposals for new USD features uh, for changes. Um, it is place to to find support for uh, code development um, if you are looking for support and it's a really good place to make community connections um, to meet people um, to learn about what people have done um, to learn about people's background um, it's a it's really a community place um, for the UC community and to that point um, one of the really key points that I want to make in in our meeting today is a big thank you to the community. It's been fantastic um, this year and the years before. Um, all these meetings could be very, very boring. They could be a handful of people staring at the screen, not knowing what to do, not, not knowing what to say, um, and that, that would be the end of it. But uh, there are so many people active in this community, so many people contributing, so, so many people joining meetings, joining the Slack, um, contributing presentations, uh, assets, um, ideas, giving input. Uh, so it's been it's been fantastic, and it's just because of the community, because of all of you. And uh, in the background, there are many people who help with this effort. I, I didn't put their names here because I probably would miss one or two because there are so many um, people um, hosting meetings, hosting working groups, work, helping with the wiki, helping with meeting notes, helping with attendance, uh, helping on the ASWIF side with blog posts, with uh, meeting schedules, with LFX, uh, with the Linux Foundation, um, on the ASWF side, with the TAC. And there are a bunch of people who make this all, all work, make this all happen. And so a big thank you to, to all of you. And um, so this is a stat from um, last year. We had on actually on August 15, I was really happy that I found that number. Uh, August 15, uh, we had 532 members on the on the Slack channel um, that we have for our, our working group. And yesterday, another August 15, we had uh, we had 837. And today we even have even more people. Um, so it's been fantastic to see all these people join, to all these people um, contribute, um, be active on the Slack channel, uh, talk about 
all things USD and talk about community issues. Uh, it's been it's been fantastic. And also we had a bunch of really fantastic uh, community presentations this year. Um, so these are the 12 um, presentations we had that we also uh, were able to make public. So everybody, everybody can, can watch them um, if people miss the meeting. Um, so you can go to the our wiki and find all these presentations there. Um, thank you again for all of the people who gave the presentations and also then allowed us to to make this public. And these these presentations are um, really um, diverse. In it's not just um, core uh, USD render features, but there's there's a right range of different topics um, that that people presented, and that's that's been fantastic. Um, and in total, uh, we had even more presentations. So we had over 20 presentations since we last met here um, in the main working group, and then even more in uh, the, the sub working groups. And in total, in our uh, history of our uh, working group, we have now over 40 presentations from many, many different people. That's really great. Um, inclusion uh, and diversity. We over the last year, these these twenty plus presentations we had, um, it's been it's been great that this wasn't from a small group of people, but we had over twenty five different presenters uh, coming and present these these presentations. It's been fantastic, um, and again, their uh, their background is very diverse. It's not just a one or two studios that present their work, but it's a uh, studios, it's game uh, from the from the games industry, and we have Scott uh, from from uh, the Metropolitan. Um, we uh, we had indie studios. Um, we had what else had we? Um, this is he developers. So it's been it's been a really diverse set of people and companies contributing, which is fantastic. Um, the one thing that we were trying really hard um, is to to also have a diverse set of presenters and it's been it's been okay um, we had uh, a handful of non-white male um, presenters but we we can do better we, we can definitely do better and so one 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 other takeaway from from today is if you if you in the future think about a presentation, um, we we encourage you to think about, hey, is there a new team member who hasn't been active in the UC working group yet, or um, someone from a minority uh, who isn't well represented in our working group, um, that we encourage you to um, to try to have them present, um, so that we also give get a, a more diverse uh, group of presenters. Um, that would be really great, because that. It, it it helps all of us and it helps the community to to be to be more diverse. Um, in a similar vein, uh, we did start a accessibility effort um, a few months ago uh, from the youth working group, and it's been so good that um, a, a wider group in the Academy Software Foundation also said they're interested in accessibility, and so now there's a uh, a full accessibility as effort across um, the academy. Um, there was a blog post um, about two weeks ago, and this is a this is a great uh, chance for us in the USD working group and the community to to drive and make a make a really good impact in in this area. And if you if you are interested in in helping out there and uh, contributing um, ideas uh, thoughts. Um, Check out the accessibility channel uh, on Slack. Um, that's a that's a great place to start. And then I'll quickly hand it over to Nick to talk about another area, the USD, open USD proposals. All right. So um, it says new. It's been up for several months now. Um, <laughs> it's new since last year. Open USD proposals is. Uh, an open forum on GitHub under the Pixar Animation Studios org where proposals for inclusion 
in USD are uh, provided by uh, by all of you, by Pixar, um, by members of AOUSD and others, as a place to discuss and share and collaborate on extensions and advancements on OpenUSD. Every week, uh, or every second of the week, we start with a roundup where we look at what's new, uh, solicit comments, um, bring attention to things that um, there are relevant and maybe need people to go back and look at in proposals. Um, there's a lot of proposals up already. This place is really hopping. So just having a quick peek here, you can see a whole bunch of things are in progress. And I invite you to regularly go there and review, um, read things. And it's really important when you read these things to don't just look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's cool. It's great. Uh, if it's cool and great, uh, being a little comment there that says, oh, I, I know how I could use this or this looks good to me. Um, is a really great indicator that people who are engaged, have processed the information, and don't really have anything particular that they want to change or modify about it. Um, and conversely, if something strikes you as with this tiny twist, it would match my use case. Um, it's a, a thing where I would hope that you don't just imagine that one day we'll get to it because everybody's so smart, but uh, please pitch in and just make a note like, um, what if there was a place where we could list our favorite kitten or whatever it is that's missing from any particular proposal? Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to highlight this one. This one's been really fun to watch. It's uh, Autodesk's web GPU proposal uh, backed with a full implementation. And by now, you have probably seen some pretty cool demonstrations, and I won't make any spoilers about that right now for the rest of this presentation. But I just want to call out that this was one of the oldest things on when we started the subworking groups was uh, people started sharing ideas about how they were trying to get USD compiling under Inscripten and working on the web under WebAssembly. And um, there, there were a lot of different ideas. Um, Autodesk made a really, really full-fledged implementation and released it as open source a while ago. And um, they've been a really active component of the working group on the web. And you can see a number of proposals around HGI since then, um, all over this spread. And it's really gratifying to see. And it's really quite exciting to have seen this go from people batting around ideas. Like, I bet you could compile this within Scriptum to there's actually an ecosystem developing. It's just amazing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I'm going to, in a minute, segue to the subworking groups, but I want to also call out that there's some discussion groups that on the ASWF Slack that uh, aren't formally working groups, but they're there for uh, any interested ideas you might have around how lighting can be represented in USD schemas, that's Lux, and how limits um, particularly user interface limits might have a role in the in the structure of metadata and what kinds of limits might make sense for what kind of values. So if you have any ideas around these things, please feel free to join those to join those channels and join the conversation. Um, so um, now we're gonna switch over to all of the subworking groups and let the individual leads tell about what their groups are up to. And I just want to say thanks again to all of our upcoming presenters for all the hard work that you guys have done in terms of organizing communities, organizing groups, and making lots of interesting results come together and providing like a welcoming forum where just a lot of amazing things have happened in the last year. All right, with that, dot, 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 Mr. Cowles. Oh. Yes. Hey, thanks, Nick. Uh, yep, my name is Jeremy, and I lead the USD Assets Working Group. And so, as it says here on the slide, our main goal is to foster information exchange um, regarding assets. So, 
it's asset design, it is schemas, it's um, how to integrate things correctly, how to test, how to build pipelines. Um, and so the three main outputs of this working group are documents for around best practices, actual like assets that are um, individual examples or tests. And then the discussion itself is actually a significant component of this group. So um, we have a really great discussion once a month and we try to take good notes. So those are historically recorded as well. And, um, and in those meetings, we talk about schema and things like that. And those don't necessarily manifest as something in our repository, but those discussions themselves are the kind of final output. Uh, so I want to talk and show, uh, talk about and show some contribution highlights, um, and just caveat that real quick first that, um, uh, this is like a tiny, tiny swath of all the awesome things that people have contributed. And these are the things that kind of like present well visually. And, um, and so they're like nice, pretty pictures to look at, but there's a ton of other stuff in the repository that, that also is not being shown here and, and is really, really great work. And so I guess preemptive thanks to everyone who's, who's contributed that. So this first asset you're looking at is the uh, Material X chess set. This has been converted to USD by Pablo Delgado and sent, and he sent a pull request to our repository. Um, the value of this is that it's a, it's a really exemplary integration of Material X with USD. There's a bunch of different materials and individual objects and assets. Um, so it's a, it's a great thing to test if you're, if you're looking for a Material X test. Uh, this carbon frame bike that was submitted by uh, Felix is an example of a um, an asset that was created through their production pipeline. Um, it has a lot of individual components as animation. Um, this is another great test. And so this is a different type of asset. So the first two were kind of like these whole kind of we we call um, like full assets. This is more of a unit test, and, and um, this is an export by Eric Haynes from Minecraft to USD, and um, it really is a rigorous test of uh, USD preview surface. And so um, it has a lot of small details that are documented well in the readme that um, if you're trying to see if your USD preview surface integration is doing the right thing, you can load this asset up and um, and then look through Eric's document and see like, is it is it rendering the way it's expected to render? In the same vein, this is a test of normals with, with bias and scale. And, um, and Eric unearthed many, many issues in different renderers with respect to normals. And uh, again, really, really great documentation in the readme file and a super simple asset that just exposes all kinds of issues. This is kind of shifting gears again. So this is a, a, a kind of like educational asset that's intended to teach what the different um, primvar interpolation modes actually do. And so I know there's a, a lot of, historically, there's been a lot of confusion around, for example, vertex and varying interpolation. And so this asset is designed to kind of document and teach like what those interpolation modes are actually doing under the hood. Uh, this asset also by, by Alan Blevins is um, a similar kind of educational asset that is designed to um, help people learn how composition works. And there are actually kind of prompts and questions in here that say, okay, if you have these composition arcs, what do you expect to happen? And it's designed to kind of like prompt you to think about what the answer is first in a kind of puzzle form and then look at the actual solution and you can open up the USD files and USD view and, and inspect them and see, see exactly what's happening and build a better intu intuition around composition. Uh, this is uh, uh, several asset contributions from Andy Beers. So Andy's done amazing work in the group. He's had a, several, several different flavors of contributions. And these are conversions from GLTF to USD. That, by the way, was also done using the GLTF USD converter that was um, created by Pablo Delgado. Um, and so this is testing uh, animation and vertex skinning um, and our conversion process between GLTF and USD. And so this is uh, finally like just a, a really, really beautifully handcrafted reconstruction of the original symbol from uh, the Maxwell render. And so um, Chris and Andre have like gone through in exquisite detail, documenting every single aspect of the original symbol and getting everything right 
and uh, and wrote that all up in the readme as well. So like all these little number callouts you see here are actually like ex explicitly described in the readme for this asset. And uh, all the different variants you see here are actually variants in the USD file. It comes with material X bindings, with uh, preview surface uh, bindings, and um, and you know it, it's really really a beautiful asset. Okay, like I said earlier, this is just like a small swath of of um, of things that that present well on slides and have pretty pictures. But there's there's about 180 documented lightweight USD files in the repository. They have a bunch of different flavors, and if you're doing a USD integration, we hope that um, that this will be a repository that you could go to to build unit tests or to test your renderer, to test import export for tools, or to um, you know learn more about USD. Uh, or if you're building a pipeline to think about like how you might want to construct your assets uh, just in terms of using the, using the USD composition me mechanics. Okay, uh, that's it. Um, and like I said, the, the actual in-person meeting, I think, is just as valuable as the repository itself. So um, if you have an asset that you'd like to discuss or a question, it's a friendly group of people that are super, super smart and there to help and um, bounce ideas off of. So uh, we have a monthly Zoom sync. Please join us. All right. Um, thank you, Jeremy. That was really, really awesome. And um, unfortunately, Michael is not here with us today. So um, I'm standing in for Michael on behalf of the camera group. Uh, the porpoise, the purpose, the porpoise of the camera group, um, oh boy, cute dolphin impressions, is that to formalize camera lens metadata used in production. And uh, this group has uh, gone on a, a long journey, uh, starting with starting with really old data um, in the SMPTE 2065 specification for ACES and uh, also in OpenUXR of standard camera metadata, things like what does it mean to have an f-stop? Um, what does it mean to have a focal length? What does it mean to specify sensor aperture? All of these things have been in 2065-1 and 4 for a really long time. And over the years, it's become kind of obvious that the, the attributes that were there made sense as a first draft, but not all of them have stood the test of time, and not all of them are properly and normatively described with like real math. Some of them are kind of unclear, is this a value that I write off the size of the side of a lens, or is this an actual measured datum that somebody took on, on set? And it became clear that this needed to be revisited. And the USD working group on camera started with the idea that the thing to do was to um, gather those attributes and make up a table, specify them, and specify them in terms of like a USD schema. But as time came on, it became clear that a lot more groups are working on similar efforts and um, that there needed to be a consensus between a whole bunch of industry standard bodies. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so the group became actively involved with the ASC, the VES, and Sympathy um, in the various working groups around camera metadata. And there's thanks here for a bunch of people who worked particularly heroically in order to get all these groups together meeting uh, continuously over a long period of time, uh, refining the attributes that they all found, uh, debating what the specifications of various aspects of um, camera math and optics are, and actually coming up with a really, really nice document. And, and it's not a, a formal product of this working group, but this working group was definitely uh, a nexus of activity because we bridge all these other groups. Next slide, please. And um, so we've got uh, an agreement across core attributes, names, units, and specifications. OpenEXR has been updated, and 3.2 is going to have the newly agreed on attributes and metadata incorporated in it. And we expect also that OpenUSD will understand where appropriate in the same metadata and specifications as has been formally adopted here. And next slide, please. And I'll just leave this up for a second for anybody who wants to take a look at this uh, very, very nice document that uh, Cook has prepared, where you can find the mathematics very well presented, definitions, 
extremely clear. And this is uh, a wonderful basis for the final output of that of that effort. All right. So with that, who's next? Games. Yes, games. Hello, I'm Francois. I'm one of the co-hosts of the game subgroup. Unfortunately, uh, TJ uh, couldn't join us uh, today. He is sick, so I will do the presentation. So we, so we created this subgroup because we found out that a lot of video game companies were interested in using USD, and the usage of USD in games would be slightly different from the movie industry. So in July 2022, we uh, held the first meeting of this subgroup. So this group here is here to gather the need for the game industry. Uh, so we, you can see the goal on the left. Um, so we are complementary to the other subgroups. And uh, as Alex said, thank you very much for the community. It's very, very interesting and uh, awesome to work with so talented people. So one of the first goal is to define what is a game asset. And uh, Jeremy uh, presented us a lot of assets, and now we need to find out how to make this asset game asset. For example, what is what are LODs in USD? After that, we need to define some schema specific for games. For example, the physics schema. Um, we are also here to try to improve the USD usage in DCC tools, and also how to use materials. Uh, for games. And finally, we want to discuss what is the best integration in the engine. For example, are we using USD at runtime? And finally, uh, so in January, uh, we have two big uh, studio presentation, one from uh, NetEase, one from Remedy. Um, there was a lot of big conversation one of the biggest is what is the difference between FBX and USD? And we tried to find out what is missing at, to USD to replace FBX in a, a video game uh, world. And finally, our friends at Remedy presented the, US, the book of USD. Uh, big shout out <laughs> to Christophe uh, Minard. Can, so, one of the big presentation was the presentation made by Remedy. And they showed us how, the, how USD is integrated in the Northlight architecture, a game engine, and why they don't use USD at runtime. They also demonstrated what are their assets now, what they are look like, how they migrated from SBX to USD, and what is the future of for the content at uh, Remedy. They ended up the presentation by showing us an impressive live editing, live editing demo. So in few words, Remedy love, loves USD. They love it so much that they wrote down the, the book of USD. So once again, big shout out to the Remedy people because they are doing an, an incredible work. So this book is uh, directed for artists and to make them understand very easily what is US, what USD is. And it's uh, written uh, as a MD book, and it's in GitHub with an MIT license. And they are using uh, Animal Logic A Lab for the, this example. So uh, you can go to the next slide. One, after one year of doing this subgroup, we found out that a lot of issues are also present in the movie industry. For example, how to remove boost. Uh, but as I said, there are some specific issues uh, for video games. So how to represent material and texture, how to use them correctly in a game engine and with USD. Another thing is, how you, is USD scale the correct way to use skeleton for heroes, or should we create a new USD hero scale? And also, as we spoke a little bit before, for the lighting, uh, how can we use USD for the lighting in game engine? 
And so for the future, we want to improve the usage of USD in the game studio. We want to introduce a better USD workflow for the game uh, in different studio. And also we want to add people such as uh, Remedy to uh, make USD shine in the video game industry. So yeah, you can come and enjoy this subgroup every month. And if you want to participate, don't hesitate to uh, poc me or poc Nick or poc Alex. So thank you very much. And now it's time for Material X. Can you hear me? I found the mute button. Brilliant. Yes, so Material X. So of course for USD, um, so USD preview surface is great, but um, so the mission statement for the Material X group is, as the name suggests, uh, to allow for seamless portability in USD, material portability, uh, but more explicitly, it's uh, to use Material X as the standardized material system for USD, as it's because uh, as we know, Material X is now supported across multiple. Uh, pl platforms, uh, applications, vendors, etc. Um, also, if you go to the next slide, um, there's justification there in the data bridge talk, uh, but I just want to go to the goals where, because as you know, as there are some overlapping sort of capabilities between Material X USD, uh, as well as different use cases. So, you know, with USD Hydra, etc. Uh, so, one of the things we want to clarify and define sort of boundaries and roles, you know, what does it make to do certain things when you use the pipeline with material, et cetera. Um, also, it's critically important that um, there's alignment and uh, feature parity, so to ensure that the material X data can flow through and round trip losslessly where, where applicable through a USD pipeline. So, and what we're trying to do is identify any gaps on both sides actually, and also look for alignment. like. You know, sometimes something is described in different ways, which should, which one should be we're steering towards material X USD, you know, to get that alignment, you know, and also plug any gaps to make sure the data is, you know, can flow from one end to the other through the pipeline. Um, also, so that's, to, and then in terms of being fast and robust Hydra rendering, so that that is important that users have, you know, an interactive experience we normally rely on Hydra when you know many USD pipelines, although you can't go directly to USD and render in some renderers. Um, but uh, it's uh, so going through different hoops, doing through data through data transforms, shader generations, what can what can we do to make sure the user experience is seamless and fast so they don't have any hiccups. And that's something with multiple uh, use cases and applications of, of hit or something we're looking at. So also we of course, you know, in terms of extensibility, we strive for standardization, but we do need to acknowledge, you know, and empower sort of diverse workflows uh, that rely on custom USD schemas, for instance, or material X definitions. So we want to make sure, you know, in a fast paced environment that people can go beyond, you know, and then, you know, we can look back at what we can standardize later. Um, so uh, of course, we've been doing a lot of guiding community as well. That's been very successful on the Slack channel. So join that. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of some of the goals, in terms of clarifying separated concerns as well. So one example I'll just give you is, uh, you know, when you're in a USD pipeline, you know, because Material X has, uh, is able to also do so, all sorts of uh, look assignments, et cetera, material assignments. Does that really make sense? Because you can't compost it in the same way. So we're trying to see what, where the boundaries lie. Also, uh, you know, there's certain things that can't be done in USP pipeline. We, what can we do to bring things from Material X into USD? Um, and uh, I'll just touch on the timeline as well. So uh, where we so we did the first presentation last year, and then uh, if I go to the next slide, perhaps. Um, so another one of the uh, sort of key goals is uh, we discussed is the alignment and feature parity. Um, and after a lot of discussions around uh, material X being enabled by default, uh, we had lots of discussions on that during the the, the year. And that so it was really great to see that that was you know that's been uh, that's been merged now that in in 2305 um, 
material X is enabled by default. So that, you know, that was a lot of discussions on all sides and thanks everybody for that. Uh, also, uh, yeah, Apple presented also uh, metal support material X USD. It was great to see. I just wanted to highlight because it's bridging between the two, you know, data uh, models. So, and so metal uh, has been supported since 1387 in material X and was adopted in 2308, uh, which updated to the late that material X version. So other conversations have been hotly debated and discussed is color space and material X in USD. Uh, that's something that's still ongoing, but very important. You know, we're gonna continue that discussion. Other things are units in terms of alignment on units, you know, pipeline flow and how it's handled in Hytra, et cetera. There's a lot of discussions around that and integration of USD material X in Python packets. So lots of, yeah, I'm gonna go through all these, you know, there's just some of the highlights. There's been lots of other discussions, but, and as you can see, I'm not gonna, you know, read all them out, but you can see that they are, they're all touching on these, these, you know, different goals. So they're capturing a breadth of the goals we set out, you know. So if you go to the next line, yeah, I just want to also highlight Pablo Delgado's uh, presentation uh, on the, that was mentioned earlier in the, in the, in the deck. Uh, it's a GLTF to USD material converter. Uh, it's really brilliant work and it's using, leveraging, you know, the the fairly recent P uh, GLTF PBR uh, in Material X. Um, and uh, I have the, you can look at the QR link there if you want to go and have a look at it further. Um, so, next slide. So, also alignment, et cetera, but it's also just improvement generally on either side. So, one is what I highlight two things that the subtle things, you know, that, um, that uh, but important to, for particular, to align, that's talking about aligning sort of the, metadata you know what does it mean you know some of the ui elements and how was metadata you know uh how is it transferred to the, 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 the model and this is important for particularly node graph um uh editors you know to uh to have a proper ui you know and also you know small things even anything you know is uh, greatly valued uh like the llama um or the the uh, string array parsing, et cetera. So there's lots of small contributions you can make that can make a huge amount of difference to, uh, you know, swathe of, you know, industry partners as well. So just wanna, that's why I'm highlighting that. So uh, just to close on that, so looking ahead, of course, we wanna continue the color space discussion. That's very particularly important, uh, but many others, hopefully many more. Also, what I'd like to see is sort of comprehensive comparison so we can see basically every single, comparative set uh, to highlight parity and any loss or lack of parity between two data models or and into Hydra. So uh, it'd also be great to really highlight, you know, there've been lots of USD productions, but highlight uh, or use case or production, anything that really sh showcases USD with Material X in a real, you know, real workflow. That would be great to highlight that next year and hopefully a lot more. That's, isn't that, yeah, that's great. That's enough for me. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on the web visualization side, um, one, one of the many goals that we've had um, is to make USD accessible to industries and domains and people outside of the traditional MNE or AEC spaces where USD was most predominant. Um, the path to our efforts is maybe not as clear and straightforward as many other groups who are maybe uh, more focused just because the because of the fact that we um, reuse and cross pollinate from the, the great contributions of all of these other groups that you've here um, exposed their achievements just before us. Um, a lot of what we've been doing is trying and promote USD as a val valuable uh, 3D content platform and language for the web in general. So that comes from either defining assets using some of the great contributions from the assets group to how do you compose world and scenes uh, using interactive technologies like uh, like what you can do in game engines to then actually delivering this to the web to folks who might not even know they're con consuming USD, but still want to learn more about this and build on top of some of these uh, established uh, tools and features. So we've had the, the one of the main uh, aspects that we've been very proud of is the contributions from uh, major industries and partners in, in this effort. So Autodesk, NVIDIA, Google, and even individuals like Felix 
that uh, you've seen contribute to the bike asset uh, in Jeremy's talk just before were of great value in what we've been doing. And to just give you kind of a, a rough idea of where we, we all started from, we kind of started in 2001 with some, um, some very raw uh, uh, presentation of what could USD on the web look like. And if you don't mind moving to the next slide, you'll see that it was, uh, I, I wanna say rough in a sense where uh, maybe it was a minimalistic way of experiencing USD on the web where you could uh, through a text editor, just to edit, edit raw USDA, navigate your 3D assets and either learn a bit more about what USD is or sort of give a sense to people of the type of experiences that they could create. And that proved some interest, but of course this there's a bit of limitation with just editing raw USDA is um, doesn't get you very far, uh, of course. So building on building on on the interest that was raised from these types of demos, uh, how can we bring this to the next level? So using things like the NVIDIA provided uh, and USD API for Python, running on Google Cloud using sort of NVIDIA GPUs at, at, to use this for rendering purposes, or letting people save, edit, share. Uh, there's their USD session so that they could either report bugs or create kind of experiences, create some some rendering um, experience with USD it's by itself without, without having to install anything locally, have it in a repeatable manner uh, proved to be of great value. But of course, this only came to more 2D experiences or kind of ephemeral, ephemeral experiences where interactivity wasn't necessarily as easy to achieve as some of the other holy grail that you could reach by having a raw USD on the web in an interactive manner. And this is where, um, thanks to major contributions from our friends at Autodesk, having some uh, WebAssembly builds uh, allowed us to build some visualization tools. Like again, you can see the some of the, 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 the bike assets that Jeremy showcased earlier from Felix where, and thanks to these WebAssembly contributions, there's now a path from having the raw USD binaries run in a web browser. So from there, you can build exporters and interactive experiences for either FreeJS or other uh, major established 3D frameworks on the web to experience uh, design experiences, um, create interactive experiences, uh, navigate the world, and even go as far as having um, user input kind of inspired from some of the game technologies to build uh, dynamic evolving content. And this is kind of a preview of what the Metropolitan Museum will just showcase and, and talk about in just a few minutes, but we we were able to, to thanks to their contributions, uh, build some demonstrations of the type of experiences that we foresee coming eventually in the future. Um, these were all great, mostly focused on the front end, um, but thanks to some of the contributions from NVIDIA and other partners, um, just last week you might have seen announced at SIGGRAPH uh, cloud-based services where now you can use uh, cloud APIs to either validate your USD scenes, uh, interact with uh, bots to interrogate um, your scenes for, for USD content, for structure, for uh, for validation tips, for optimization features. And so now we've kind of tied some of the pieces of the entire loop where we have ways to visualize USD on the front end, but also build larger scenes on the back end using cloud APIs. So one of the things that we are looking forward to is uh, having more contributions from people from diverse backgrounds to um, build tools, uh, try these features out, whether front-end engineers, back-end engineers, full-stack full engineers to build content. Uh, let us know if they need more. Let us know if things don't work quite the way they were expecting to. And uh, sort of let, let us be amazed what, what by the type of, uh, of dynamic content or, or features or automation features that people see building on top of this. So uh, thank you very much to all of the partners who have been um, on on board with us for for the, a number of years and uh, very much looking forward to hearing what people can uh, can start building on top of this um, and I'll I'll uh, 
now uh, let let the the Met Museum that I just alluded to a few minutes ago talk to you a bit more about some of what they've been working on uh, for USD. Ah, oh. <laughs> should should I run that or is someone else running that? Uh, you can you can you can run Scott, yeah. Yeah, it might be uh, cleaner. Let's see if this is successful. Ah. Uh. Hello, does everyone see that? Yes, we can. Okay, well, uh, uh, thanks for having me. We I tried to put together an interesting presentation showing some more behind the scenes of our um, amazing program here at the Met. And uh, so this is a little overview of our department. Um, and I, I always like to underscore uh, the photography, uh, the two-dimensional photography that uh, you know our team works on. We have uh, 16 photographers on staff. And this is actually work from different photographers. And every morning we have a meeting. And it's an amazing thing to see these uh, artworks fly on the new big screen we just put in. Um, but most importantly for 3D, uh, we've spent years perfecting making a 2D medium look three-dimensional uh, through lighting um, and composition. So it's it's really fitting. Uh, but where does our work go? Our, our work supports publications. That's uh, was very much the driver years ago, along with merchandising. Uh, we've been photographing here since uh, 1906 uh, continuously. But of course, we supply photography for the collections. When you go online, you'll see the images of the objects. We have a full web team, which you haven't met yet, but you will in the future. Um, and, and they design our interactive. All of our web public facing work goes through a department called digital. Um, we also support conservation, uh, pre and post conservation photography, as well as supporting uh, the best practice in photography throughout the museum. Um, of course, galleries. Uh, we don't generally photograph events, just if anyone's interested to know that. Um, we focus on the objects and the galleries. Uh, and of course, we have a um, production team. We actually have nine people working on post-production. And very much, uh, it's interesting because we don't work on color. We've got color nailed years ago, but we focus on uh, extending backgrounds and things that uh, couldn't be photographed um, in, in one shot. A, a large percent of our, of our images go directly from camera directly to you. Uh, I need to bridge, and, and it's important to realize that the 3D is just a small part of our program, um, but also that the uh, all of the different media stems from traditional photography, including the, uh, you know, the discussion about spatial computing and uh, uh, immersive media, I, I think it's really good to reflect that we've been doing um, stereo photography for quite some time. I found this uh, uh, Viewmaster reel on eBay from the Met, um, and it's fascinating. We might revisit those objects someday. And then, of course, the talking Viewmaster, uh, which was, uh, you know, just fascinating to me that you squeeze the button and you get audio and images. Um, and I'm using that as a segue to sort of tie the two activities together. Um, because I see this uh, in the Met, when our photographers see 3D, they're usually disappointed in some way or another, whether it's resolution or fidelity, uh, color fidelity, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we have a, a, a challenging audience to satisfy when it comes to our work. But in terms of range of objects, we image from the smallest objects to exteriors of buildings, uh, and everything in between uh, in, using different techniques. And, um, you know, this was a, a little snapshot of it. Th there was a there's a gallery project going on where uh, uh, the M Michael C. Rockefeller wing is being completely renovated. And uh, this is just a snapshot of some of our ongoing work. But I thought it was fun to look at the scales of these objects when you see Wilson, uh, who some of you met at uh, SIGGRAPH photographing, uh, doing photogrammetry of the ceiling, or Jesse photographing that house post um, that you'll see in the picture catalog, it just as a sense of scale. Uh, it's it's fascinating to me. So there's there's um, no cookie cutter here. Um, that's one of our challenges is it, it, a lot of things are 
uh, image in situ. But uh, a little bit of an overview of how we work um, and what drives our work here. Um, historically, we started with a focus on conservation, um, supporting um, um, restoration and mount making, and I'll show you some examples of that. We also do outside requests. If someone's looking for an artwork, they can call our licensing team and we will actually set out to digitize for external requests. That could be artists, it could be commercial, um, and that goes on uh, for years. It's, uh, it, it's not every day, but it happens uh, quite often. Um, and then we're constantly working on research and development and working towards imaging our collections in 3D, but we're in a no hurry because just look at all the changes in USD in this past year. So we really have no lockdown pipeline um, it's very much ad hoc and evolving constantly, but we do want to get to a place where we can trust and in, in the formats and the process um, that we can um, know that that will be solid for the future. Um, so we're working, uh, you know, constantly on that, and and that's where we're interested in the best practice and standardization. So the uh, AOUSD announcement uh, and the goal of ISO standards is, certainly piqued our interest. Um, and, you know, again, like I said, we're always referring to our own work as the level of quality that we want to achieve. We're not looking to other communities, but we certainly learn from other communities. And that was apparent at SIGGRAPH, you know, the, the deep dive into learning about what's happening in filmmaking and how that can translate to um, cultural heritage. And then, of course, um, you know, what's the next generation as we all move through um, how to, what does photography become at the Met and out in the world? Is it a merge? Is it a hybrid? Is it two tracks or one track? Um, I think they do come together. Um, speaking of coming together, I thought this would be interesting to share the tools that we use. We do not have, I, I sometimes feel sad in this meeting because I'm sitting here with the minds of the industry and people who can write code and make magic. And actually we're very much on the user side. So these are the tools we use and these are the tools that don't support USD. And it's it's very interesting, those red ones. Um, we're very much hoping that they, uh, you know, get on the train because this is actually some of our photogrammetry apps uh, don't run on Macs and don't support USD. And therefore we can't really build a pipeline on USD till everything is interoperating. Um, but I have to say, I'm seeing tangible progress. Um, again, this, this slide was to sort of acknowledge the uh, evolution of USD and the new organization and, um, you know, all of the sidebar topics that have to come together. Now, I'll talk about some of our 3D deliverables um, that I mentioned for conservation. Uh, you, you know, there's only about four or five objects on the Met website in 3D. So, you know, I, I thought I'd share some of what we've been working on over the, since about 2016 uh, in 3D. And so we have uh, work to make supports in mount making, um, cross sections. The, this is all conservation related. Uh, this piece on the right is very interesting because, you know, that was done uh, before they removed the cement in our conservation lab from that, um, um, well, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry, um, coffin, I'm not sure. What's that? <laughs> Sarcophagus, I'm sorry, I'm not the art expert. I'm just, apologies. Um, here's some other work, uh, deviation analysis reports. That's very common. Uh, was, was this molded from the same casting that comes up a lot because these, uh, um, bronzes were made in additions and you can see there's so many, uh, areas where 3D is, is used for comparative study. Uh, of course you saw the, uh, chroma presentation that, that presentation was great, but it was just one project and that's, my goal of sharing today is like, that's just one project that we worked on. And it was a, it was a great one, but um, you know, the idea of reconstructions is, is, is a big topic. Um, 3D to 2D rollouts is a very common um, request. Uh, we have a lot of cylindrical artworks and people want to see the motifs splayed out. Um, so if anyone makes plugins and automation, that's an interesting area to look at. 
Um, and then we have these physical reconstructions. In this case, um, uh, there was a, a finial from a staircase that was missing parts, and it was reconstructed digitally, uh, milled and handworked, and put back into a public space. Um, by the way, everything since the AO USD slide, uh, we talked about what USD would be used for. Everything I'm showing you. <laughs> so uh, I would like the this group, which is really creative, to maybe connect your own dots and think of exciting ways and applications. But if you look at this, to me, this reeks of USD. Um, and although this wasn't composed in USD, but just imagine that this is a no-brainer and this goes on all around the world. Uh, people are scanning fragments and trying to put things back together uh, and make visualizations. So, you know, this is uh, our job is to scan the content and we do some of these visualizations, but I hope in the future that becomes more broadly accessible um, in, in different tools because some of the tools are just downright daunting to, for someone who's not skilled in 3D to step into. Um, speaking of stepping into, this is Mrs. N's palace, and we digitized every single piece of this artwork. It's it's comprised of over a hundred um, elements of, as you see on that image on the right. And what was interesting here is that the artist, the only way to re, to know how to build that uh, box, that artwork, is to go by this napkin sketch. So literally, our teams have to rely on this napkin sketch when they want to rebuild. Mrs. N's palace. So while they were building it in the gallery, we set out to digitize every piece as quickly as we could um, to capture that and make what you see here. In, in fact, it's interesting because I, I met Martin uh, from uh, IKEA is, at SIGGRAPH uh, for the first time. And um, this is, it reminds me of, this is the IKEA version of the artwork assembly. So uh, we had to make a guide for our cons conservation teams, but we have all that content, all those pieces. There's so much more that we can do with this object, um, but we don't have the bandwidth to do all the finishing and cleanup of those pieces because there's certainly holes in, in those scans. But um, what a phenomenal project. Another phenomenal project has been uh, and an ongoing um, effort, and this falls into some of these outside requests where uh, this, this tomb, uh, the, 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 the chapel is in Spain where this was originally from, and they they like that it's in New York for exposure, but they they wanted to make a, a facsimile, and so we did the digitization, photogrammetry, laser scanning, um, and a lot of the people on this call, uh, you know, don't understand why we need such high fidelity meshes uh, and accurate metrology. It's because a lot of these things are used for reconstruction, for scientific analysis, not just a pretty picture on the web, which is a a big uh, problem in misconception in 3D right now is, uh, you know, there's so much emphasis on um, eye candy, but there's no meat behind it. Um, this is another example of uh, that, uh, where we can achieve uh, higher throughput is only by looking at objects that are very similar. So here uh, we're building a rig. Uh, we're in the middle of testing this right now. Uh, the people that are helping us with this rig are people I met out in LA during the open source forum. So we've made connections with this community and we're driving forward with the solutions with everyone on this call. But what was interesting is uh, our first tests worked out really well in uh, pretty much any photogrammetry software uh, with just a camera and changing positions, but we would only kind of knock out around 100,000 uh, polygons. And you think, well, that's a lot. This looks really photographic. The, the images on the left are those. Um, but it's all in the texture. When you turn off the texture and look at the mesh, there's nothing there. There's no detail. It looks like melted ice cream. So um, by focus stacking those cameras, there's about 27 captures per shot. And stacking them, we can achieve, uh, what is that, uh, 10 times the resolution. But more importantly, uh, if we go after scanning 4,000 of these cylinder seals, a, we don't want to do them again. B, they need to be faithful and they have to replace what we could do with a traditional camera. And additionally, if we want to run AI and image recognition, we need the fidelity. So I hope I'm being clear. 
sometimes for cultural heritage, we have to like every object, even something the size of your pinky is, I think what you call in uh, motion pictures, a hero asset. Um, this is another thing we're looking at is uh, again, into that quality thing is uh, here was one of these pictures from the uh, MCRW gallery renovation project. And our photographer, Peter was forced to lay seamless behind this object because there was a wall right behind it. It's like 20, 30 feet tall. And it was a real difficult thing. So the best he could do is capture it. And our post-production team cleaned up that 100 megapixel shot. But as I was walking by, I thought, hmm, I wonder if we do like a 16K texture and you know render it, uh, how close would they get? And, and this was done uh, originally with a uh, Leo scanner, a handheld scanner. But during the progression of this project, we actually decided to do uh, photogrammetry. And I, I just wanted to show you some quality comparisons. This is a 2D photograph of the uh, detail of this object. Um, this is the photogrammetry mesh. And this is the textured mesh. And um, uh, it's still not photographic, but it's we're we're pretty happy with this. This is you know pretty amazing and more than we thought we would do in the beginning. Um, what was happening is if you went and scanned these with the Artec, um, you wouldn't get that uh, detail of the the mesh there. It would be uh, much softer, less defined. So if someone wanted to measure a split in the wood, it really wouldn't be useful for that. Um, and then in the quality department, we're doing work with color. And we mentioned uh, with the Chroma exhibition how important color was, and we used scene referred color. But as we've been going by, we're starting to look at, well, how can we make sure that the 3D models are viewing and rendering correctly? So we decided to make a synthetic SG chart um, using the measured values and actual gloss measurements, physical measurements of a chart to try and make a perfect digital twin and then threw it into software to eliminate it, render a TIFF and use the same software we use to validate to ISO for our still cameras. And uh, we've had some initial successes, but I've talked to a lot of people out at SIGGRAPH in person about this testing. And um, you know, to us, this is mission critical. If we can't reproduce a color chart, then how are we gonna reproduce the art? faithfully. And, you know, just in a quick test of this with very little effort, uh, that was uh, rendered in stager to a TIFF. Um, and, and then I converted the 3D model to an AR, but that's the real color chart on the right and the synthetic on the left. And then we had fun, you know, with the AR in the studio. So those were kind of fun. And the, the one on the right looks very, you know, kind of real. So, you know, we also want to have some fun with this. Uh, I mentioned uh, in um, February about our interest in making reference assets. I, I don't know if everyone has seen this. It's very hard for us to find the right objects that could be used this broadly uh, with, you know, unrestricted. Um, but it's still a goal to get, we're hoping to get six assets out that are complete. 2D photography for that quality bar and the lighting capture the lighting, capture the HDRIs, provide everything that one would need, uh, including the source images for the photogrammetry. The goal being to sort of uplift this to speed boost the uh, testing at the highest level. Uh, and again, this is specific to cultural heritage. And then, you know, you don't see a lot of our content online because it's been so difficult to push through all these barriers and platforms. Um, and, you know, this was a little animation of uh, uh, an AR uh, that was developed for the Chroma exhibition uh, on an eighth wall platform. And, you know, it, it's, it, it worked well. It was well received and it conveys the scientific findings in a very lightweight, fun way. But um, uh, it was only because we needed a way to share this cross platform and uh, what we're working on now is uh, through this group, we met um, Felix, who makes the needle engine. And uh, it was very interesting because we just, this is a very preliminary view of this. Um, but that's, uh, 
that's using USD and geo. Well, Felix is on the call. Maybe in the Q and A, he could explain it. But um, bottom line is, it's removing a big friction point that might help us uh, in the future uh, with our sharing our objects online. But what's nice about this is you get the full USDZ experience on iOS and uh, on the web based. Uh, you get a GLTF. Um, and then, of course, my favorite uh, delivery mechanism still is the USDZ, the native USDZ, where we can embed audio and interactivity. I still think there's something very different and unique about that compared to building things on web pages. Sometimes I just want to have a file in my phone that, and be not on the web and uh, enjoying experience. So um, I believe there's a synergy here in that we can download uh, USDZ from a web-based experience with the audio. And some of you have kind of been kind enough to throw tests out at us. And the one thing about this group is uh, I was literally on a USD meeting and um, I saw a chat in the Slack about something and that's how I met Felix. And while the meeting was going on, he was rendering prototypes. And, and that's what's really amazing about this community is uh, it's it's so uh, open and supportive of people who want to do new things that are not engineers. Let me see if I can change the page here. Um, and to me, the most rewarding thing is uh, when we look at that Zemi figure that we built the AR of, um, I, I didn't share this in the past, but uh, an artist in residence, the reason we scanned that object was an artist in residence wanted to activate that object and he cast it in bronze, our 3D scan, and was planning, he planned a whole ceremony out in Harlem. And this was um, really at the middle, late of end of the pandemic where people were just coming outside. So it was amazing to see this art out on the street. And, you know, so our team's work, it was very rewarding to see our work in cultural heritage get out to the public get out to the, the world via the AR with a curator telling you what the object is about. And then, you know, of course, the, the USDZ uh, enabled us to have these um, kids come up and do just what we did behind the scenes, coloring and procreate and moving these files around to their parents seamlessly um, was, was just really great for our education programs. Uh, you know, because it, 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 it would be odd to do a custom web development for something that simple. So I, I'm just trying to put our work in context with the broader community. And, and then I thought, after I saw all the USD presentations, every single USD presentation is talking about software. Oh, you can connect the world of software as that's the goal. It's actually the software is a vehicle to get to the public um, and all the people that interact with art from my point of view. So it's interesting to see uh, Jensen's slide with all the software applications and the services, but actually all those services feed actual people. And um, I think that's really the true power of USD uh, in the, when it's free in the world is um, that, that we can connect workflows and people through software and applications. And, and, and I think that's the really most amazing thing about this uh, that gets me excited because, you know, I, I think about why am I doing this? Why am I pushing on this so hard? But I think it's because I think it's the right thing and the right community um, because of that open nature and the collaborative nature. And uh, so I'm just here to say thanks. And, uh, you know, we hope to have more to come. And, you know, that's it. It's sort of exciting to be here. And, you know, it's exciting to meet all of you. We're just as excited about what you do. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, as always, it was super interesting to to see that insight. And I think your your feedback on this community and what it what it what it is, what it when what it can be, what it can achieve, um, it's it's really it's really awesome. And it also you you touched on many, many things that our sub working groups and working groups are are working on. So that there was a really great summary and a an overview of how things come together. Um, and then uh, let's see, we, we have one more section. If I can share my screen again. Yep. 
is that I wanted to click on here. That's there we go. There we go. Uh, which is the Alliance for Open USD that uh, Scott touched on uh, and we mentioned earlier. So the Alliance for Open USD was announced on uh, August first. For people who don't know what uh, AUUSD, which is the Alliance for Open USD, is uh, the the one sentence summary is that the Alliance for Open USD is an open nonprofit organization dedicated to fostering the standardization, uh, development, evolution, and growth of open USD. And the so the founding members of this new organization um, are uh, Pixar, Adobe, Apple, Autodesk, and Nvidia. And we had at the at the launch, we also had Cesium, Epic, Foundry, Hexagon, IKEA, Sidefix, and Unity join as, as members already, and others are now signing up to join. Um, AUSD is hosted by the Linux Foundation as a joint development foundation project, uh, which is uh, particularly interesting because it's A, it allows us to um, to make USD an ISO standard eventually. It's it's set up in, in that way and we're using the, the JDF um, infrastructure for that. But it's also really interesting because the Academy Software Foundation is also a Linux Foundation project. And so that makes it makes it really easy for uh, ASWF and AUUSD to, to work together. Um, and this working together, um, so we're setting up a liaison agreement between ASWF and AUUSD so that these two organizations can effectively uh, work together. Um, we're also uh, working with Kronos to set up a, a similar relationship um, to work with them on, on similar uh, things. And that gives us in the in the USD space kind of three different pillars um, for for the community, uh, which are open USD. So that's the Pixar repository, and that is the open source project that everybody's using now. Um, then we got now AUUSD, which is then the uh, the organization to made to uh, create a standard specification for USD based on the OpenUSD implementation. And then we got here uh, our working group and ASWF as the, as the open uh, M&E interest group that feed into the open source project that's using the open source project where we have partitioners, um, people who are using USD, giving feedback um, in the M&E space. Uh, this is the, the place for, for this community to thrive and, and discuss and evolve. Um, and then use uh, AUUSD as the uh, standard specification for better interop. Um, and this is this was one of the the summary slides I had uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, AUUSD and the USD working group really are complementary. They work fantastic together, and it's it's a, it's a great combination of things. Um, Something we we haven't we haven't touched on in the past um, that I want to want to share with you quickly here are a few details on how AUSD works, um, and then with that give you a better idea of um, what happens when things happen, and um, if you if you want to get involved, how you can get involved, and if you even if you're not involved, how do you how do you get updates? How do you learn about things in AUUSD? And so um, you can you can read up on all of this. There's a, uh, a working group processes document on the AUUSD website. It's a it's a long legal document that defines the full structures um, of the alliance. It it um, explains how working groups are set up, how they work. Um, but it's a it's a long long document. Um, the the summary is this: um, AESD at the at the top we have a steering committee, um, which is similar to the governing board uh, in ASWF. Um, so that is uh, basically running the organization and making um, the the final decisions on any specifications that get published. Um, then we have a technical advisory committee, the TAC, uh, which is Similar to the tag in, in ASWIF, uh, which is 
the uh, it's an oversight committee across many many working groups that we have to to have a consistent uh, standardization effort going um, where we where we cross working groups um, have conversations to align working groups um, to resolve if there are conflicts resolve conflicts um, but it's it's there to ensure um, we are moving all in the same direction um, in the in the working groups and then yeah at the bottom uh, we have many we have multiple working groups um, to to do actually work on specific topics each working group has a, a clearly defined charter so there's a there's a scope uh, within which the the working group can work and what it what it aims to achieve and so that that uh, that work is what the the TAC and the steering committee are um, reviewing and uh, approving eventually and so in the beginning we're going to have uh, one working group and that is the core specification working group um, which uh, is there to define uh, to write a specification for the essential core parts of USD that are currently existing in the uh, open USD implementation. Um, so that means uh, no new features, no no additions, no 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 bug fixes really. Um, it is what's in open USD today. We take a subset of that, um, define this as the core and make a specification for it. And then in the future, we there can be more working groups for specific to specific topics. Um, not going to name any, um, but there are uh, different areas we can work we can work on, and that people and members in the alliance can uh, can suggest and propose as something a working group can be can be formed for. Um, another interesting part you don't you don't have to read all all the details here, uh, but it gives you an idea. Um, there is a very detailed and defined process how a working group is doing its work. Um, that is um, slightly different to, to how ASWF is, is doing some of the work. Um, there are, it, it begins with, with a proposal um, that is reviewed, um, then all the work happens. There are um, official votes within the working group for um, any, any proposed work. Um, there's a tech review. And uh, crucially, there's also IP reviews um, by legal teams for any any patents or any um, intellectual property uh, issues that might come up within the specification. Um, and at the end, there there is a um, final vote in the steering committee to actually approve um, a deliverable a specification. Um, so that is there's a very clear process with clear steps um, that we're, we're that we're following um, that you can and that you can contribute to. Um, if you are not a member um, or if you are if even if you are a member um, but also want to be in the in this used working group here as a as a very open forum and a open community, um, we are um, as I said setting up this liaison agreement uh, between ASWF, um, and AOUSD. Um, so this is still a work in progress, so we can't share the final, final details yet, um, but uh, we're, this is the intention. Um, the intention is that from the user working group, we can put out proper and um, concrete proposals uh, in open USD proposals, the, the website that uh, Nick showed earlier um, for concrete um, defined work and proposals. Um, and uh, USD proposals um, is then has a CLA um, that allows us to, to take on those proposals and move them over to a USD and, 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 and integrate them into a standard specification there. Um, so there's, there's an official flow where IP rights are covered um, and that lets you contribute even if you're not a member of AAUSD. Um, there's also the USD forum um, that uh, can be used for discussions, that can be used for 
um, uh, ideas um, that gets uh, into AUUSD. Um, and there is, again, there is a legal coverage for the, this. Um, so please, if you do make any, any suggestions, if you make any proposals um, on the forum, uh, please read the terms of service before so we know what uh, what it means to uh, to propose something um, and um, something that could lead into the uh, AUSD working group specifications. But there is point is there are ways for us in ASWIF to move our work into AUSD. Um, and then last last slide I think um, if you um, if you're not, if you if you want to learn more about AUSD, keep up to date with any updates they do. Um, there are general announcements um, the organization is doing on their website, on the forum. Um, there are there are also specific parts in the USD forum for AUSD working groups. So if you are a member of a working group, um, the USD forum is going to be one of the core places for you to interact with other people. Um, and there's also a, a regular community update meeting that is for everybody, that is open to all members and non-members of the Alliance to, um, to get an update on uh, ongoing work, on uh, new proposals that are uh, put out, on new uh, specifications that are published, um, and then also talk about uh, future, uh, future ideas of where the organization is heading. Um, and with that, I think we're pretty much at the end. Um, the if you, I hope you're all super excited about USD and the working group now. Um, if you weren't already, um, the next USD working group meeting is in about two weeks, in exactly two weeks, Wednesday, one p.m. Um, all our sub working groups uh, we meet every four weeks, and we we do have them on on the calendar on the ASWF calendar. So you just subscribe to that and then get all the updates. And then we get this long list of Slack channels uh, with all these fantastic members um, working with USD uh, and then the subworking groups. Uh, also the USD Lux discussion and the USD Limits discussion. And I think with that, we are at the end of our deck and we're ready for the Q&A. Uh, so thank nice. you all for, for sticking around with us. Uh, Nick, you want to say something? Yes, before we uh, transition to the Q&A, I was wondering if we could go um, and take a quick peek at the slide that shows the three different organizations. Yeah, but I wanted to just address one of the questions that uh, came up quite a bit at SIGGRAPH, and um, that is many people asked if this represents a possibility for divergence of the spec from the original goals or um, a uh, possibility of it becoming rule by committee or something like that, rather than having a coherent vision. And so I wanted to, to say that the way this is organized and structured, it represents um, continuity in leadership and continuity in ideas and direction. And it provides a, a place for where formally uh, groups that previously informally discussed and uh, and negotiated concerns can uh, have a, a place to consistently talk about them in the open and ratify them um, with the open USD architects as to is this you know in line with the plan and so on and so forth. So um, I expect it to be uh, a cohering force, not a fragmentation. So just want to throw that out there because it came up a lot. Yeah, one hundred percent agreed. So, um, are there any questions? We we have our sub working group leads with us, so you can you can also ask them questions. If there are no questions. Maybe everybody's itching to go off and research all the things from Scott's presentation. <laughs> yes. I want to find out where those color charts come from. <laughs> <laughs>
And we will try to to make the uh, the recordings here public, or at least some some part of this recording for people to to revisit and look at the the pictures again. So there will be an official open USD specification at some point, uh, Valerio asks. And so people could write an implementation in other languages. Well, um, the point of uh, specification is to enable that kind of activity. That's not the main point of that activity. The main point is that if you've got a normative declaration or specification of what USD is, you can have confidence that when you open a file, uh, it has characteristics of being well-formed, deterministic, and so on and so forth. And the very information that's necessary in order to have that kind of absolute confidence in the integrity of the data also means um, that you can, in fact, write your own implementation and know that it'll work um, properly by definition. <laughs> Felix asks, how does the goal of ISO standardization work together with the current dynamic of USD changing regularly and often? I know that the from the GLTF world, these goals can clash quite a lot. Um, yeah, I think that that ties up with a whole bunch of other conversations, like what's the relationship of OpenUSD to the VFX platform? Um, what kind of cadences make sense? Um, what kind of stability is possible across the API? at what intervals and so on. Um, and so I think the answer to your question of how does the goal of standardization work with that is that these are the continuing steps along that path. We have to understand, um, we have to understand how it interoperates with the platforms, et cetera. And it's, I think Steve made that point at SIGGRAPH. Um, that it was time to to take ESD to the next level to to take the the next step in in the evolution, um, where ESD matures and becomes even more stable, um, and so it they work hand in hand, um, ESD becoming more stable and a specification existing um, that are two pieces in this lovely puzzle that, we, that we're dealing with um, that, that helps us all to move forward. Bert asks if the X-Rite digital color checker SG target as seen in the video is something that's downloadable. Hi, uh, I was just typing back. I think it's a, it's a valid concern and we're actually vetting everything because we are making a digital twin. I'm hoping that when you look at this as a global research mission to develop standards for cultural heritage that will have a sort of, uh, and I know there's certain licensing on the, uh, was it DNEG site? Where, uh, Kurt, there's some downloadable files and there's a specific license. It's a matter of if people uh, will trust uh, that that's the case, but I I'm hoping that we get support. There's also some other charts and if we can't get support, we'll make our own chart, Kurt and I. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, there's a familiarity with the SG chart, but there's another chart that was designed around uh, ISO standards that is from a smaller uh, entity and we're already having conversations because uh, the, the I think the benefit of this outweighs the um, downside. And frankly, they'll all sell more analysis software. <laughs> So, you know, what we're talking about is objective analysis. And for everyone on the call, you know, I am in no way uh, steeped in all the nuances of rendering, but I do know what in and out means. And, you know, when we put that chart on uh, and analyze it, uh, the TIFF that's rendered, it doesn't matter how it gets there, but it should render the way uh, from the source data to the output. So I'll leave the technical to the experts but we know what those colors are and 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 they really should make the trip um but um also the lighting units we've had discussions about physical units in software and how i arrived at exposure was very uh convoluted 
uh, when I was trying to light with, uh, you know, virtual copy light. So there's a lot of things, uh, partially because cultural heritage is new to some of the things that many of you are um, into. But this originally started because of um, a question I had about how we're going to work with our ICC workflow into co open color IO workflows, because most of the 3D software we use is not color managed at all. So, you know, and I think Kurt would agree that Kurt, Kurt has a background in color too, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I imaging color and video color kind of developed under different paths and uh, um, getting them to talk to each other uh, is not, uh, you know, uh, there were different goals at play. And with 3D, there's a different set of goals and we've got to try and find ways to harmonize this a bit. Um, and I think Scott's idea of having, okay, we're, we have these targets that we've been using to validate still photography for years um can we use that to validate you know a still image we render from 3d is a very valid idea it's so simple <laughs> but um yeah i think it's it's a conversation starter if nothing else it's a little project we could dip through i hope to just take that file if we uh get it done through a number of different tools and just see what we get mm -hmm. and share the reports objective reports not like does this look pretty, but is it what it was, uh, round trip? Uh, and and that would be really, uh, wow, talk about solid underpinnings for standards and archiving. So anyway. And to, to re reiterate another point, it's um, this USD working group really benefits from, from the ASWF community at, at large with, we have open color AO, we have open image AO, open exr lots of really uh, material x and many more projects that are um uh, that tie in into our work and that we that we rely on that we that we use and collaborate with and so this um ASD, aswf community is really super super useful and, and great to have uh I, I just i like the structure and i hope it stays I know it will stay intact and it's what's going to drive the standards efforts more quickly because uh, having spent, I don't know, 10, 20 years in ISO standards, uh, it's the development of the idea and the crystallizing and agreement on the idea that happens more quickly in this kind of group. Um, and we can aim towards formalization on faster tracks because there'll be less debate because we'll all agree in advance. So, you know, it's this on the ground work that's really been fascinating that it's so refreshing. And I'm not even technical. <laughs> yeah, this this group is not going anywhere. The, the only thing where it's going is it, it's going to grow and mature and going to create super awesome content with super awesome people. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be in in one year we have an, we're going to have another uh, town hall. Um, that's going to be it's going to be great. Cool. Any more questions from anybody? I guess this is a general question, uh, but uh, and that's something that I, and I know I've been reticent in, in getting to my duties is helping helping with the website, Alex. So I apologize, but um, one of the things that I I've, I've heard just some, some stuff on on my end as someone who's not coming from an entertainment background, but we do use USD. Uh, data quite frequently um, to just have maybe broader messaging that's that's clearer for you know for some of our executive team they don't really understand what USD is for example and you know we try to explain it's a referencing system not just a data type and um, you know having really clear examples of that um, is I think helpful for messaging this to more broadly so that you know organizations like you know like like Max are can get involved with AOUSD with this group um, in a more formalized way uh, would be really helpful. I know that NVIDIA has already done some great work on the documentation side, but would just love to to have more of that content. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my 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 first ask, and then second ask if I can if I just related but not the, the same. Um, something that I, that I was talking over with uh, at SIGGRAPH with Guido and um, and with Aaron Luck was uh, about 
it's such a fascinating uh, concept, right? Already, just this, this data schema as a whole, USD. It would be great to kind of have a, a historical timeline as well of how this developed and how you know the different people who have who have contributed to it. Um, in the same way that they had that slide in the Material X uh, presentation, that you know here's here have all been the contributors and um, maybe making some sort of like fun three JS visualization of it. It would be great to. Uh, just put out an open call. I'm going to put a message in the chat, but um, would be would be fun to just get all that information, collect it, and then put, have that on the website as well. Yeah, that's a fantastic idea. I like that, uh, Jennifer. For the first point, in fact, yeah. even if you are in the media industry, some people doesn't don't understand USD neither. So I think the book of USD is also a good. Uh, uh, first step on it, and uh, in fact, it's one of the goal of uh, every subgroup, I think. But in in a game uh, subgroup, to improve this, to help people understand and use USD. So, uh, yeah, Very and fun. thanks again for your work in the web pages and the wiki. It's coming it's along, and and thank you also to Jessica, who's also been helping tremendously. And we've got to get it organized. It's always hard to. You, but who am I to say that you, you guys are making such incredible open source contributions, but I've got to get to the website and actually start building that out more. But um, yeah, appreciate it. Cool. Uh, any any last minute questions? If not, there's this Slack channel that all of you obviously join or already are part of. Um, uh, the next week we do have, what do we have next week? Um, we got the camera working group next week, got the games working group next week, uh, the material X working group, uh, and then August 30, uh, our next UST working group. During the games, uh, meeting, I hope that Luis and Phil will dissipate the big mystery that is, uh, proposed us uh, three weeks ago. So, yeah. Tune in. Like that. And then thank you everybody for joining today. Uh, thank you to all the presenters, to all the working group leads. Uh, thank you to Emily and ACBF for hosting this. And thank you to Scott for the presentation. And again, thank you everybody for joining, for asking questions, for being interested, for contributing to the working group and just being being awesome human beings. So thank you and see you again in two weeks, one week on Slack tomorrow today. Thank you, everybody.